Uh, today I'm going to talk about the other feminisms which I have encountered uh, with, on the course of my research. And I would especially like to pay attention to how these other feminisms lead to the notions of weak resistance, to affect and everyday sensibility. And since also this panel is um, uh, addressing the issues of curating, and <laughs> I'm also a curator myself, so I was thinking about how could I um, uh, kind of add my curatorial perspective <laughs> to this presentation, and I decided that I will do it in, a vis in visual terms, uh, and these are three images uh, which come from an exhibition which is freshly opened and curated by me in, uh, Re in Latvia, in Jurmala, in uh, Rainis and Aspazias uh, summer house, so three artists from that exhibition, just um, uh, now I see that maybe this uh, uh, emphasis on contemporary art is a little bit uh, different from the other presentations which we are having these days, but well, since our seminar is about also differences, so I kind of accept that. So, um, and I would like to start my presentation by addressing uh, two questions which are very typical and common when speaking about feminism in our region. And uh, one uh, question which all of you have heard many times, I'm sure, is who is afraid uh, of uh, the, the F word? Yes. <laughs> and um, I would like to pay your, uh, to draw your attention that um, I have noticed that recently in these debates, uh, uh, a shift in affective um, atmospheres have uh, occurred, and now uh, we are not we are not only talking about these fears of feminism, but also uh, a certain fatigue, uh, a condition of um, being growing tired of <laughs> of, of, of this F word, uh, and why why is this is it happening? Um, I have noticed in some discussions in uh, art historians, uh, with art historians and theoreticians, that they kind of suggest that um, these struggles on terminology seem endless. Like we, I mean, we can never ar seem to arrive at a certain agreement. What counts as feminism? Is it feminism? Was it a feminist or not? And maybe mm, we should instead focus and really divest our energy, uh, invest our energy into discussing, for example, uh, lives of women, how they lived, or their contribution to culture, or for instance, on gender politics, etc. Yes, so these are these debates, which also correspond to this affective um, atmospheres, which uh, encircle these debates. However, in today's presentation, I would like to argue that we should not allow ourselves be taken by this fatigue that we have to <laughs> resist uh, this feeling of being tired and tired of feminism and that this resistance um, is uh, is good for us and it, it's good for, for two reasons and the first is uh, that if we still um, yes uh, try to stay with feminism uh, and stay with the, with troubles which is which are connected with this term feminism um, uh, the first benefit is kind of more global uh, uh, no sorry the first one is not global the first one is local <laughs> excuse me so the first is that uh, for us in the region um, it uh, it provides like uh, this entry point uh, to to really access to interact, uh, to borrow from, to rework, to interrogate, and to draw encouragement from the really affluent sources of feminist theories worldwide. And we can't deny that this is something that is very useful for us, right? So why should we give away the, the term feminism only because that we don't know exactly what it means? <laughs> and the second benefit is then uh, more global is that by um, insisting on and uh, by reclaiming feminism, we also open up possibility to rework, revisit, and expand the understanding of what co counts as feminist, right? Adding new perspectives and subjects to feminist inquiry, which is probably good and enriching for this transnational feminist movement. So these are my arguments. And then, <laughs> I still would like to return to these um, fears and 
anxiety uh, about feminism, which of course um, is very common, maybe not in this auditorium, <laughs> right? But if we refer to more uh, to different spheres of, of society, and of course um, this attitude in the region to feminism is often denial, doubt, stereotypical ideas, still very much stereotypical ideas, and also reluctance to take it seriously, and this has been addressed already by multiple researchers, by the way, also in the context, um, uh, in Latvia's context. And nevertheless, art historians and theoreticians in late socialist and early post-socialist culture have used the term feminism. And this is what is basically <laughs> I'm going to talk about today. However, also it has to be noted that normally this uh, term feminism appears with an adjective. Yes, with an adjective as if to underline that this is not the feminism, whatever the feminism is, but that it's um, rather a regional or a cultural variety. Now, this is the kind of uh, a list of these other feminisms which I have encountered. This list, of course, is not um, exhaustive. Right, there are other, also other authors and other usages and other, well, maybe not even terms, but like sources, I, I, I haven't collected them all. Also, it is not my purpose. I'm more interested in, in seeing how these perspectives are, where they are leading. So just to go very quickly, without really focusing and explaining the sources, because I don't have enough time for that. So, intuitive feminism, latent feminism, Reluctant feminism, proto feminism, para feminism, soft feminism, and centrifugal feminism. And probably this last one needs maybe some comment because this one comes from Gerardo Masquera, who is a theoretician who writes about Cuba, right? So we can again uh, think about these connections, the similarities, or differences with. Um, Eastern Europe and Latin America. But I think that this is a really helpful term because, and it also somehow fits in so good that I ignore this uh, geographical, um, geographical difference. So, um, yes, uh, when uh, seeing these and encountering these other feminisms in different uh, texts, I have uh, concluded that most, mostly they are used for two purposes. Uh, in one way, it is, they are used to underline that the artist itself does not identify it as a feminist. Right? This is a very common um, problem, and uh, you all know about it. Uh, so, but for, from my perspective, this is not really um, this is not the end of the world, right? <laughs> because. Um, uh, of course, I know that this question of artist intention is very important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but uh, we can always preserve our own like agency as a researcher, and we can say yes. But uh, from my point of view, we can talk about it because this and that. And also, uh, it is important to underline that um, we know that we should not. Well, what is feminism after all? Is it really a fixed identity, right? Or maybe we can approach it from a different perspective, for instance, as a, as a process, as a certain kind of performance, as an approach to problem solving, which I like very much. Or for instance, as an artistic or a political strategy, namely that feminism is not what it, you are, but what you do. And in the, from that perspective, it, we really open up, we have these new <laughs> possibilities to really engage and apply this term without hurting anybody's feelings, right? So, in the second context where these terms appear, appear are uh, uh, rather under underscoring that while artist work is, it, is indeed feminist, uh, there is lack of support from society and the prevailing art discourse. Those these works of art usually do not receive proper or consistent feminist attention, right? And nor there has been an attempt to collect, interrogate, and frame them as a possible feminist tradition and genealogy. This is a, this is what I find very interesting and <laughs> what I would personally love like to do. So. Uh, in a sense, these uh, other feminist feminisms indicate that, that these feminist works 
in a way levitate in a feminist void. And of course, this void is <laughs> again a term which we have already encountered yesterday, right? So these are these two usages. However, I would like to propose uh, also other approaches, what we can, uh, how we can use these terms to um, engage with uh, maybe broader philosophical discussions. And this will be very short, but <laughs> I will try to keep it consistent. So let's look at these first two, intuition and softness. What does it remind of us? Of course, it reminds of these typical feminine traits, right? This, the essential feminine uh, character. But maybe we can use them strategically in social critique to question the prevailing ontological and epistemic paradigms. For example, neoliberal rationality, which is this everyday experience for the Baltic states today. And in, in favor of embodied knowledge and lived experience. And here I really would like to um, use intuition in a way that uh, Sarah Ahmed is suggesting to use it as a way of thinking with one's skin, yes, as a way of thinking with one's body. And from this perspective, we, on the one hand, we um, solve this um, essentialist question, and on the other hand, we still can proceed further. Then, what shall we do with uh, this term reluctance? Reluctance to, to be embraced in a discourse. Here we make, a, we can, I suggest that we make a connection to a desire to stay unnameable, a desire to avoid stereotypical visibility and oversimplified identities. And again, it has to be underscored that a feminist is a very, uh, is an identity which is very much prone to be oversimplified, right? So, and or another step forward is to refer to this um, um, concept of opacity, which, for instance, Riley Marling, a theoretician, which I'm sure all of you know very well, has already uh, uh, used and, and showed how it can be applied as a strategy for feminist resistance. Then these terms like centrifugal, proto, and para, of course, they um, kind of suggest that we can talk about feminist uh, temporalities, the feminist geographies, which are somehow beyond, further than, or parallel to this uh, mainstream, whatever it is, uh, feminist discourses. Uh, and thus, we can also enhance the political significance of the periphery. Again, of course, we can uh, argue our Baltic states periphery or no, <laughs> yes, but uh, from a certain perspective it is, and uh, support non-binary, rhizomatic way of thinking and, of course, feeling. So this is how I think these terms can lead us to bigger issues. Also, what caught my attention was the fact that all these usages of other feminisms and the way feminism is understood is so very similar to the way how affect theories defined, de, uh, define affect, right? Where affect is then corporal, lived, immediate, urgent, everyday, but is beyond discourse. Uh, in this case, beyond the established feminist tradition, beyond visibility, avoiding fixed identities, and reluctant to be defined and comprehended. In that way, we, I think that this uh, similarity is telling and that we have to make use of it. So I would like to kind of uh, underscore it and propose that feminism then can be encountered in an effective way, which is obscure, emotional, semi-hidden, unconscious, and maybe even unwillingly, yes, which again bring, uh, takes us back to all these discussions. No, no, I'm not a feminist. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a feminist. Then, um, again, I uh, make a reference to Sarah Ahmed, who suggested that feminism is a worldview that is uh, close to one's skin and which starts with a sensation, like an affect. It allows us to con account for how we are touched by the world. And please pay attention, touched by the wo world, is, um, it implies this passivity. And we know that from feminist theory, we always are very precarious about this passivity activity. We always want to claim the agency, the, yes, the activity of the subject. But here I, I see this possibility to also claim the importance of passivity of not, uh, as not something utterly and absolutely negative, but something that can give us some uh, hopes, <laughs> yes, some hopes. So, and here this passivity, of course, is very much, again, connected with this latent, latent feminist feminism, which means a feminism that, which is not presently active or 
it is not active in a traditional way. So maybe we have to change our ideas about how we perceive activity. I have also noticed that this, um, the importance of agency has been underlined by several presentations today and yesterday. And of course, I don't deny that agency is a very important thing. But again, maybe how do we actually approach agent? What is agency for us? And here, I would like to make yet another connection to Polish thinker Eva Majewska and her code concept of weak resistance, which actually kind of summarizes and collects all these um, ideas which <laughs> have been expressed so far. And for her, this weak resistance is like this resistance without agentic and heroic subjects, without clearly defined enemies. And this is also something which I guess applies very well to this socialist, post-socialist uh, condition. Aimed at survival, which is very important, aimed at survival, not at victory, right? So how can we celebrate this feminism, which, right? And with unbalanced and unsystematic qualities and movements. So this weakness, again, of course, is especially good also because that uh, weakness Im immediately makes its connotation to women as the weak sex, right? So just one more connection we can find. And um, this all draws us to this uh, next sentence which suggests that, yes, we can speak about this feminist resistance with feminist discourse, uh, like this re resistance without heroes as in accordance with Eva Majewska and is very similar to this feminism without feminists, which is this uh, popular trope. I don't even know who is the author of this, but it's somehow in the air when we talk about feminism in Latvia and probably the Baltics. And so, um, yes, the conclusions is that I hope that my short presentation uh, helps to um, to give, provide insight into how this uh, staying with the trouble, staying with feminism um, actually opens these possibilities for us. And one, 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 like one block of possibilities is connected with um, providing feminist insights from center to margin, yes, to paraphrase bell hooks. And while all these categories like para, proto, and centrifugal, um, Mm. centrifugal feminist sensibilities enable us to avoid and or interrogate established feminist hierarchies, temporalities and geographies. And then the second, this block of benefits or possibilities is really a possibility to address feminism as an everyday sensibility, which is something also I believe that more people could relate to, right? Then we think, say that feminism is something that <laughs> happens to you every day and not that something that you learn from, uh, like texts like Butler or Spivak, maybe. <laughs> well, maybe I'm wrong, but I have this uh, idea that it could happen. So this feminism based on embodied and affective patterns of ordinary life. Feminism is not a strict and homogeneous identity, but an approach to enhance problem solving Solidarity, and we talked about solidarity yesterday also many times. Survival, again, yes. And last, <laughs> I also put pleasure. And this is an important point for me because um, I know that all this feminist killjoy discourse of which surrounds this feminist activism and that it's hurtful, it's hard, and it breaks us apart and it creates feeling of isolation and um, all other negative things. And I would like to really emphasize that feminism also gives us um, some new perspectives of, on joy, on pleasure, uh, on, um, uh, on happiness maybe, yes. So this is what I would like to this end on this optimistic note. Of course, you can't see, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, okay, thank you very much.